Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqtatam min nisani yafqahu qawli. I want to start my talk by telling you a story. So it was early 2012 and at that time I was living in Egypt, in Alexandria to be specific, um, with my husband Amr. And it was the middle of winter there. And for those of you who have been to Alexandria in the winter, you'll know that winter there is basically um, torrential rains and lots and lots of thunderstorms. So one night I was craving ice cream and I told my husband or I asked my husband if he would get it for me after our Shat prayer. And the masjid was literally 10 steps away from the entrance of our building. You don't even have to cross the street to get there. So he said, okay, he left home just wearing his getabe or his thawb and flip-flops. Um, and while he was there praying Asha, it started pouring. And when I say pouring, I mean, you know that kind of rain where you feel like somebody opened a faucet and you're just standing under it? That kind of rain. So when I heard that outside, I resigned myself to the fact that I was not going to have my ice cream that day. You know, I thought there's no way Amber's gonna walk all the way to that store that has that specific brand of ice cream that I want, that specific flavor that's, you know, a couple of minutes away because it's just raining too hard. So I waited a few minutes to see if he was gonna come home. He didn't. I waited another five minutes. He was still not home. Another five minutes, another five minutes. And after a while, I heard him come in. So I went to see what took him so long. And there he was standing, soaked from head to toe, laughing with the ice cream in his hands. And that's the kind of man that my husband was, the kind of man who would go out of his way <clears throat> to take care of the people he loved, whether he had to walk through a literal or metaphorical storm to do so. He was the kind of man who would tie my shoelaces for me when I was too pregnant to bend over that far. And he was never the kind to say to me begrudgingly, remember how well I took care of you? Or you owe me for everything I've ever done for you. That wouldn't really be love, would it? Love isn't empty grand gestures or keeping score on who wins which arguments. It's a quiet and steady mercy of empathy and compassion. It's the ability to seamlessly be yourself while simultaneously being the person that your partner needs you to be at any given moment. Amr taught me that love is many things, and above all, that love and mercy is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah divided mercy into 100 parts, out of which he retained 99 parts with him and sent down one part to earth. From this one part emanates all the compassion that all of creation exercises towards one another. So much so that an animal lifts its hoof above its young, lest it should get hurt. So every ounce of overwhelming love that Amr showed to myself and my daughter and his family and his parents, that's just a manifestation of one of the parts of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to us, uh, down to us um, on earth. And people have often asked me, how I was able to move forward after my husband was killed. You know, it's a trauma that you don't easily forget. But simply put, I was able to carry on because, because of that one part of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed on this earth. You know, the kindness shown to, be my, shown to me by my family, my friends, and even complete strangers was a manifestation of that one part. And when I think about that, when I think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us the situations and things and people that take care of us so beautifully and fully, <clears throat> how then can any of us ever despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or lose hope in his plans for us or his ability to heal us after we've fallen when he has kept with himself 99 parts of mercy? For those of you who are not familiar with my story, I'm just going to briefly recount it. So in June of 2013, my husband and I traveled from Canada to Egypt to visit his parents. They hadn't met uh, their granddaughter Rukhaya just yet. Rukhaya's bookshelf, by the way, is named after her. So the summer of 2013, for those of you who remember, uh, was very tumultuous. It was a very chaotic time in Egypt. 
Um, it was rife with protests and, and arguments between family members and, 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 and um, friends. And it all led up to the military coup uh, led by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. And needless to say, I wanted to fly back to Toronto. You know, I wanted to leave the chaos of Egypt. And our flight back to Toronto was scheduled for August 19th. But we didn't get onto that flight because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had different plans for us. On August 14, one of the largest massacres of protesters in modern day history happened at Rabah Square in Cairo. And according to Human Rights Watch, around a thousand people were killed that day. So two days later, on Friday, August 16th, Amr, my husband, was at a large protest in Alexandria, standing up for the rights of his brothers and sisters who were killed indiscriminately. He couldn't remain silent about the gross injustice that had taken place because silence was never even an option for him. And naturally, I was worried. You know, I, I saw everything that was happening. It was chaotic. I was worried. I called him to see if he was okay. And he assured me that everything was fine. He said there were thousands of people on the street, men, women, children. It was almost like a family affair. And then he told me something, and I still remember that statement to this day. He said, I'm on my way home. And he was, in a sense, but not the home that he or I thought. And that was our last conversation. About 20 minutes later, I received a call from his phone with the news that he was shot and killed by an army sniper. He was shot through his beard, and the bullet exited the back of his neck. Around 45 others were killed in that same place on that same day. So after Amr was killed, um, my entire world was turned completely upside down. I was immersed in chaos, and I was struggling to navigate my way out of, um, out of this feeling, but also out of the country. I, ne I needed to leave Egypt. And along with the immense grief that I was feeling, I felt like all of our plans for the future were gone. They were just wiped. They were wiped clean. I would do this thing where I would close my eyes and try to picture what my life would look like in a year or in five years or in 10 years, but I just couldn't see anything anymore. And for those who, who've had this sensation that they just can't see anything anymore, it's, extremely, it's an extremely disturbing state of mind to be in. It's like, um, not to trivialize it, but it's like when your computer screen dies as you're working on something really important and you're trying your best to get it to, to, to start up again and you don't know whether you're going to ever have access to those things that you've worked so hard on. And when people ask me how it was that I started to recover from this dark and chaotic time in my life, the most honest answer I can respond with is through the reading and contemplation of the Qur'an. Up until this point in my life, I was taking the Qur'an for granted. I would read it and try to, you know, try to understand it, try to con uh, contemplate it, but I wasn't aware of just how important it was for my existence, you know, for, I, for my emotional health, for my spiritual health. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Qur'an, O mankind, there has come to you instruction from your Lord and healing for what is in the chests and guidance and mercy for the believers. After Amr was killed, I approached the Qur'an with a kind of urgency that I had never felt before. You know, I was like um, a lost traveler in the desert who was on the brink of death because I, she hadn't drunk anything in days. So when I took that first sip of water and I experienced how it quenched my thirst, I didn't ever want to stop drinking. And that sip of water for me was the Qur'an. It quenched my thirst. Uh, it quenched the thirst of my, my heart. It, it, it eased the pain and it lightened the burden that I felt was weighing on my shoulders. It made me understand that I was not alone and that there were generations upon generations of righteous people before me who went through immense trials and who succeeded through patience and perseverance. There were days that I didn't want to put the Quran down, not even to eat, not even to sleep. I stopped watching TV completely. I literally only watched two things in the entire year after Amr, was, after Amr passed away. And I still remember them because there were only two. The first one was Frozen because Try as you may to keep that out of your household and it, it just doesn't work. Um, and then the second was an episode, some cooking episode on the Food Network. I made the, the decision to cut it out of my life because I refused to numb my emotions. I wanted to feel everything. I wanted to intimately know my grief because I felt without truly knowing it, I would never be able to emerge from it. I completely immersed myself 
in the Quran. And while I read it, I felt connected to the rich history of those who were there before me and who rose in status with their patience and overcame that which had hurt them. There was Asiya, who was exposed to torture at the hands of her own husband. And she says a dua in the Quran that's so beautiful. My Lord built for me near you a home in Jannah. And it taught me to ask Allah for the same for my family and a home near him in Jannah. And it taught me about the necessity of tearing myself away from the torture that was inflicted upon my heart in this world and setting my sights on the everlasting world. There was Prophet Yunus who cried out to Allah from beneath three darknesses, the darkness of the belly of the whale, the darkness of the ocean, the darkness of a night, saying, La ilaha illa ant subhanak inni kuntum min al-zalimin. There is no deity except you. Exalted are you. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to his calls. He freed him from the belly of the whale and he, he, he cured him from that which ailed his body. And then he returned him to his people who in his absence had actually accepted his call for the truth after so many years of preaching. It taught me that no matter how deep the darkness in my chest was, how lost I was amongst the people and how alone I felt, if I just reached out in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would hear me, he would see me, and he would help me. There was Maryam alayhi salam, this is one of my favorite stories. She gave birth to Prophet Isa and she was completely alone. She was in so much pain that she wished she was dead. And she wished that she was just somebody that was in the history, like somebody forgotten. But instead of reprimanding her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent her words of comfort and it was said to her, do not grieve. It taught me that even though I had my weak moments where my patience crumbled and when I said or did things contrary to what true patience should entail, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could and would forgive me if I actively sought his forgiveness. And you know what? It helped me forgive myself a little bit too because if Maryam alayhi salam had this very human and momentary break in her patience and she's the best woman of all of humankind, then surely I also still had a chance to patch up the cracks in my patience. Then Maryam alayhi salam was told to get up and shake the palm tree so that dates would fall and she could eat and drink to her satisfaction. So those who've seen thick trunks of palm trees know that shaking one is not an easy task. And those who've given birth know that just standing up after giving birth is challenging enough, let alone doing anything else that's physically demanding. So the fact that she got up and she shook <clears throat> the tree taught me that being in a state of pain did not exempt me from working hard. So after a little while, I also stood up and I started to work, pushing the pain to the back of my mind. I started helping in small ways with charitable causes or campaigns that I believed in. And I started writing. And at that time, I didn't realize that what I was writing would eventually become my book, A Temporary Gift. Knowing that I was able to do something to benefit others helped me to understand that I still had a purpose to fulfill on this earth. And then there was Prophet Yaqub, who was apart from his most beloved son Yusuf for many, many years. He told his sons, I only complain of my suffering and my grief to Allah and I know from Allah that which you do not know. It taught me to only complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the pain that people had inflicted upon me and never ever mistakenly complain to people about the pain that Allah had caused me. And I was actually recently thinking about the story of Prophet Yusuf and how he was thrown into the well by his own brothers and he spent years in prison and, and most of the people on earth forgot him, forgot he even existed. Some scholars say that he spent 40 years apart from his father, to the point that his father Yaqub had gone blind with grief over his separation from Yusuf. Later in the story, when his other sons returned from Egypt after being in the presence of Yusuf, their father said to them, Indeed, I find the smell of Yusuf. So for 40 years, he grieved. For 40 years, he held on to hope. And for 40 years, he didn't forget the way that his son smelled. It's a pain that's so real and palpable that our hearts can't help but connect to it. And yet after all of it, after this lifetime of living through um, this immense ordeal, the two prophets, Yusuf and Yaqub, they weren't bitter. You know, they weren't seeking revenge over what was done to them. They didn't want to see their family punished. Instead, Yusuf said to his brothers, 
No blame will there, will there be upon you today. Allah will forgive you and he is the most merciful of the merciful. And Yaqub also said to his sons, I will ask forgiveness for you from my Lord. Indeed, it is he who is the forgiving, the merciful. And at the end of the story, Prophet Yusuf says to his father, and my Lord was certainly good to me when he took me out of prison and brought you here from Bedouin life after Satan had induced enmity between me and my brothers. Indeed, my Lord is subtle in what he wills. Think about this kind of mercy and gratitude. These two men were so forgiving to others, to the people who wronged them, and they were so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even after experiencing years and decades of pain and injustice. But they understood something that's often lost on us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is subtle in what He wills. The disappointments and tragedies that we live through are not standalone events. There's no such thing as a meaningless moment of pain or a random sequence of setbacks. Every single thing in our lives was planned just so, to call us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to push us towards the path of our righteous predecessors, to invite us to raise our hands and call, call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acknowledge Him as our Lord. Sometimes when we have unpleasant days, we start questioning everything. You know, we, we can't immediate, immediately find meaning or, or epiphanies in our pain, so we just assume that there are none. But the reason that we struggle to find meaning is that we haven't waited patiently. We don't trust that with time, every single event in our lives will unfurl itself and show us just how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been to us this entire time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Yusuf up from the bottom of the well, out of the prison, into a position of power and influence. And long after his death, his story continues. It's immortalized in the Quran and in the collective consciousness of believers throughout history. We can also create a legacy for ourselves through patiently trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and working hard, even when we haven't yet seen that first ray of the sunrise. We push through the darkness knowing that with every hardship is ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of Surah Yusuf, Indeed, he who fears Allah and is patient, then indeed, Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of those who do good. If you asked me just three or four years ago whether I'd ever write a book or stand on a stage like this or own my own business or, or anything like that, I would, I would have laughed. I would have laughed in your face and said, there's absolutely no way, right? Um, it's not just that I was unworthy, it's that also that I didn't even have the desire to do any of those things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans for us and maps out our lives for us in a way that sometimes we don't understand, but in a way that always, always, always turns out so much better than anything we could have come up with ourselves. I want to end my talk with um, a related story from my life with my husband, Am. So after we were married, uh, Amr and I decided to go on a trip to the Sinai region of Egypt. And for some reason, we thought it would be a good idea to <laughs> to climb Mount Sinai together while we were there. So we left our hotel room in the middle of the night uh, and we started the trip at around uh, three o'clock in the morning. We were with a group of tourists and we were meant to reach the summit by sunrise to watch the sunrise uh, on, uh, on, on the mountain. So Mount Sinai is surrounded by other mountain peaks as far as the eye can see. So as we were walking in the dark, their shadows loomed around us. And I was in absolute awe of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of stars that pierced the darkness. And me, being born and raised in a city in Toronto, I'd never seen star stars like that in my entire life. It was both awe-inspiring and frightening all at once. But even though the sky was speckled with all of these stars, the path ahead of us was pitch black. And all we were armed with were, were these um, really weak flashlights that only showed us like three or four steps ahead of us. <clears throat> so I couldn't quite see the top of Mount Sinai because it was so dark. But as we climbed the mountain, the dawn light began to emerge and I was able to see, to finally see, just how high the mountain was. And at that point, I turned to my husband and I said, if I had known the mountain was this high, I would have never let you talk me into doing this. <laughs> but because I didn't know how difficult it would be, I tried. I attempted it, you know, I just put one foot in front of the other and after a period of time, a hard period of time, I was sitting at the summit surveying Allah's creation. 
And if you're, at this, if you're on the summit of Mount Sinai, no matter where you turn, 360 degrees, there isn't one single sign of civilization, not one house, not one hut, nothing, all mountains. It's one of the most um, beautiful experiences I ever had in my life. And of course, needless to say, I didn't regret climbing that mountain, even, it, even though it was one of the most difficult physical things I've ever done in my life. The darkness scares us, you know? The fact that we can't see except what's immediately in front of us scares us. The faint, looming shadows of what might be scares us. But if we had stood at the base of this mountain of life in unadulterated daylight and saw the path that led to the peak, the pain and the struggles and the scrapes and the bruises that we were going to get, would we have ever climbed? Would we have ever attempted anything at all? Light is a gift, of course, but darkness is also a gift. The unknown is a gift. It gives us the courage to try. It gives us the courage to say every so often, perhaps it's going to be just a few more days until I reach the summit, or perhaps just a few more hours, or perhaps just a few more steps. So yes, we can't see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned for us, and we don't know when we're going to reach the summit of our goals. We don't know ahead of time that it's going to hurt. We don't know ahead of time that we're going to be injured in the process or lose our fellow travelers in the night. We don't know and we can't know. If we did, we'd never climb. If we never climbed, we'd never achieve anything. We'd never reach the summit and see the sunrise over Allah's creations and we would never understand the purpose of our tests. Trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that your feet keep moving forward even when you can't see what's ahead of you. It's knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to care for you. It's knowing that he's going to grant you the gift of courage to keep going and the gift of healing when you fall. Not if you fall, but when you fall. Allah's light is the only light that we need in the darkness of the unknown. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the light that we need to walk in this world and the light that we're going to need to walk um, on the day of judgment. And to never leave us to the care of our own selves, even for the blink of an eye. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.